I'm Jimmy Moore from the Live and La Vida Low Carb Show, the longest running health podcast on the internet. And we're here for you. This is your time to shine. So if you have questions about paleo, uh, low carb diets, health in general, fire away. Otherwise, it's going to be a real boring session. Back in the corner over there. <laughs> Although I can thrill you guys with some hard questions. <laughs> That's what they're waiting on. Yeah, questions for the questions. Hello, I've got a double whammy question. So I've got a friend who has Parkinson's disease, and I also have a friend who has Crohn's disease, and I was wondering if you could give any advice nutritionally for them. Uh, Not everybody at once. Uh, I don't think I can answer the one on Parkinson's, uh, but on Crohn's disease, I, um, I think it's very hard to say every Crohn's patient should be on a particular kind of diet. Uh, I think that's the first thing to say. But a paleo type diet, for example, um, I personally put my Crohn's patients on, I tell them to go wheat free and dairy free, personally. I find it quite beneficial for them um, in the short term, symptomatically. And then I personally do some work on their microbiome. Um, there are rat studies which have shown in patients with spontaneous colitis that if you improve mitochondrial function, you can reverse all symptoms of colitis very quickly. Um, this hasn't been proven to my knowledge in human trials yet, but I think it's a reasonable starting point. So diet-wise, wheat and dairy-free is my normal starting point with them. Um, but then I do some work on the microbiome and on mitochondrial function. So, in terms, I completely agree with Rangan actually. I think, in terms of all autoimmune type diseases, then uh, wheat or grains and dairy are, are two foods that just really shouldn't be in the diet. And I think there's a reasonable amount of um, evidence to support that. Um, there's some interesting trials going on in uh, pediatric Crohn's disease where they're looking at the SCD, the specific carbohydrate diet. Um, and that was being done at the Seattle Children's Hospital um, where actually there's a doctor there who found that lots of his patients were trying it and doing really really well and they thought hang on a second what's going on here and, and now they've started trials and they sort of have got a chef to cook all the meals for the kids and they're actually going to do that in real sort of randomized controlled trials so I think that's another thing to look at the specific half carbohydrate diet. Um, in terms of Parkinson's disease I think there's also an increasing amount of evidence first looking at the gut so um, gut permeability and the gut microbiome uh, linked with Parkinson's disease and we never really know if that's cause or effect but I think focusing on gut health um, you know making sure that you're getting a good range of uh, prebiotics making sure that you're um, treating any kind of uh, bacterial overgrowth in the gut is very important and then again addressing any kind of inflammation in the brain is very important and then I think um, things like uh, managing blood sugar um, low, you know, lowering carbohydrate intake, uh, potentially even a ketogenic diet, or just uh, increasing ketones by um, taking something like an MCT oil. So you can artificially, say, raise ketones um, with medium chain triglycerides. So I think all of those strategies potentially could could really help somebody with Parkinson's disease. Yeah, and um, it's interesting your question. So we talk about the gut being the third brain because of its innervation. So. You're, you're, how do you address the two brain systems, the brain and the gut system, and uh, the approach to diet is similar. And in the back of Keto Clarity, we actually list the studies that are out there looking at Parkinson's specifically and how a ketogenic diet actually is helping with that. A very, very high fat diet, 80-90% can help with the ketogen, or help with the Parkinson's. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am, right here. Hi, um, my brother-in-law was diagnosed with gout, and now he's like totally off meat. Can you can how would you convince him that it's not the meat, or is it? Um. Yeah, so uh, we see variable responses to say um, a low carb diet that include includes meat and gout. Um, we, we want to think about kind of combinations of foods, so maybe it's these inflammatory uh, sugars and grains plus meat that maybe causes the outbreaks of the gout. So, you know, we talked about uh, reducing purines and so forth in the diet, but again, we try to think about combinations. And so, in general, we find that uh, people do well with a, a whole foods diet where they're re reducing those processed foods and um, gout symptoms improve. Now, if uh, people still have problems, 
you know, you don't have to have a red meat diet. I mean, you can have fish and pork and chicken and those kinds and of other things that maybe limit the meat, but um, I don't like the idea of just, you know, blaming meat for that condition. Um, whether the condition is gout or other um, conditions linked to low-grade inflammation, I often use, I mean, I mentioned before with Crohn's a wheat and dairy-free diet, but I often use a 21-day elimination diet with patients. So uh, remove lots of the common known triggers, and then for 21 days they, they go through that process, and then you slowly reintroduce one food group at a time every three or four days. And I find with a lot of cases, and I have found this with some gout cases, you can start to um, determine what your own body is reacting to or what you might be, you know, what might be precipitating your own symptoms, and that includes gout. So it's, a, it's free, it's simple, and it teaches a patient about, you know, their own metabolism and what, what they need. So I use that all the time in my clinic. So one of the things that people uh, really worry about uh, with gout is obviously the um, is the high purines in the diet. So it's part of uh, DNA. And if somebody is taking um, meat out of their diet and then swapping it with something like corn or any kind of microprotein, that's even higher in purines, so that's going to make them even worse. Um, but what uh, really happens is we've got a, a buildup of uric acid, and that's basically a, a breakdown product of any kind of oxidative stress. So it's through the, func it's through the action of a, an enzyme called a xanthine oxidase. And anything that can sort of increase the activity there, so any kind of anything that's increasing oxidative stress, so any kind of particular stresses or toxins in the diet will worsen that, but particularly um, a high intake of fructose, which increases uric acid and increases uh, xanthine oxidase. So um, sugar, as well, is, is going to be, a, you know, from the basic biochemistry, is going to it's going to be a big problem. And if you want to read more about this, there's actually a really great uh, online article that was published on Tim Ferriss' website uh, that was a missing chapter in Good Calories, Bad Calories by Gary Taubes, um, all about gout. They made him cut it out, but Tim was like, I want that information on my website. So Google gout, Tim Ferriss, and Gary Taubes, and you'll find it. Hi, I'm on Periscope. I'm one of the followers has just asked about any and how you can help ME, what causes it? First time I explain what ME is. Uh, so ME stands for myalgic encephalomyelitis, um, otherwise known as chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, I think uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and something like fibromyalgia exist on this sort of spectrum where chronic fatigue is at one end and fibromyalgia is at the other end and basically you, here you're very tired and here you have a lot of pain and then there's actually a continuum from one end to the other. And I think when you're looking at these diseases, uh, there's a, a lot of potential uh, causes, and later I'll be talking about autoimmune disease, and I think it's very, it's very similar, the system is very similar. When you look at those diseases, they have a high, um, high incidence of leaky gut, so high gut permeability, and then once that happens, you've got a real, um, basically, domino effect of, of the chronic inflammation in the body essentially attacking itself. So I would treat uh, chronic fatigue as I would treat an autoimmune disease with an elimination diet and then all the other lifestyle factors that we talk about in terms of sleep and stress and you know, as much movement as people can and it's also making sure that we don't, um, we're on a day that you feel good, don't do too much and on a day that you feel bad, try and do it a little bit more so you're not, you know, if you do too much then you feel even more tired the next day and you can sort of spiral that way. So very graded and just making sure that you're just giving, you know, doing a little bit better every day, and I think that works really well. That's beautiful, Tommy. Thanks. You said so well with that British accent. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, I, I wish primary care doctors, GPs, understood what Tommy just said, because uh, that is uh, a term given to everybody that says, I don't know what's wrong with you, take an antidepressant. And that's so wrong on so many levels. Yeah, I probably agree 120% with what Tommy just said as well. I think that is exactly the way I deal with chronic fatigue syndrome, ME type patients. I think we've got to be very careful when we ask or think about um, diseases as labels and we say, well, what causes this? I think it is really the way we label things is often a collection of symptoms and there can be multiple, many different causes starting at the gut, trying to heal the, uh, 
the gut lining, get less intestinal imper uh, permeability, can help a whole range of conditions, including ME, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. So that's always my starting point. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'd just like to add to the discussion on gout, if I may. When this happens, I work for the military, and I have um, a large population of Lebanese soldiers to look after. And I've also been working with Professor Peter Andrews, who is um, Professor of Human Origins at University College. And he's done work on the loss of Medicaid during our evolution. What happened was that um, some monkeys were actually able to, um, because they still have Medicaid, they're actually able to metabolize uric acid. And as we moved into colder environments, we lost the Medicaid. And this is what gives rise to gout. And we lost the Medicaid because it made us more efficient at converting fructose so I've had to have a look at all this to try and help my Nepalese uh, patients because they're coming to me with gout in their mid-20s. Unbelievable. Yeah. And then faced with having to take on a purinol, losing their career, etc. And the simple advice I've given them is to stop drinking the energy drinks, which are very high in fructose, and avoiding uh, simple fruit sugars. And I'll find that those alone are an adequate care for clinician and prevent their uric acid levels there. Thanks for the input. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am, right over there. That works too. Hi. Um, when I have tested my blood sugars um, in the past, the early morning ones particularly tend to spike. Um, and the rest of the time, yeah, with a sort of low carb, high fat, primal ish diet, um, they're, they're, yeah, I would say acceptable. Um, so I think I've read about there might be other causes other than this diet around that, possibly stress hormones or other reasons. Just wonder if you have any thoughts on that. High blood sugars in the morning. Yeah, so we see patients that tend to have uh, high blood sugars in the morning. Uh, blood glucose, can you convert like uh, 100, 110? So uh, 5.7, is it? 5.7, yeah. It's, it's 100, 5.6, or 5.7. Yeah, a little above 5 normal, yeah. Uh, 6 yeah. millimol, okay. Yeah, yeah so... Close to 120. Almost. Yeah, how I... Uh, some people talk about physiologic insulin resistance, um, and uh, that may be something to consider, but how we deal with that in, in our office is that we look at all the metabolic markers. So we look at HbA1c, you can do oral glucose tolerance tests, uh, look at inflammatory markers. And uh, although it seems to persist, if uh, all the other markers look good, we just tend to follow it and, and note, but it's just one parameter of a, of a whole picture. So I think what, what you've probably heard about is something called the dawn phenomenon, yeah. which is basically a high and elevated cortisol in the morning. Yeah. Um, and cortisol is obviously one of the hormones that um, promotes the breakdown of, um, say, proteins or, or, pr or promotes gluconeogenesis or making more glucose. So there's definitely an argument that in people who have early stage, what we call adrenal fatigue, which, which doesn't really happen in the adrenals, but probably happens in the hypothalamus due to um, essentially inflammation in the hypothalamus affects the signaling that basically tells what your adrenal glands to do. Um, in early on in them, people see either um, a spike of cortisol, and cortisol is meant to spike in the morning, but it either happens at the wrong time, it happens too early, or you get a very big peak. So that's, um, if that's something that's happening to you, and then the rest of the time your blood sugars are very well controlled, then I would think that um, addressing stress and other inflammatory factors are going to be more important than just, just worrying about carbohydrate intake. Statins. I wonder if you have any 
sort of practical advice on how we can help those people actually approach the NHS and, and not just end up on settings as the first step. That's your wheel. That's your oh. <laughs> Practical advice on how to address that. Okay, um, I think a good start is to first of all ask their doctor: Are there any alternatives? Because um, sometimes there's no conversation happening. Sometimes it's a "This is what you have to do." So I think even there are some doctors out there, quite a few, who are open to having a conversation, saying, "Well, you might want to try a few more things first before we go down that route." Um, I think Jeffrey, um, Dr. Gerber, had a really good point in his talk, which is doctors are actually trying to do their best. They're, they're just going on what they have been trained and I won't go as far as saying brainwashed, but um, maybe I would, but I'm being filmed, so maybe I shouldn't have just said that. But, uh, um, you know, there is a school of training which teaches us that cholesterol is the bad guy. and. It's like a lot of these things, it's oversimplistic. Cholesterol can be a useful marker for some people or a certain type of cholesterol, but it's, it's part of the whole big picture. What does your family, do? what should a family member do? What should a friend of yours do? Um, I think you've got, to, you've got to help them educate themselves rather than go to the doctor for the answer. Try and get the information yourself. Read some of these books, you know, read some of the lectures online. Challenge your doctor. Um, to say, well, what about this? I've read this. And there are some open-minded doctors out there who will say, you know what, I don't know about this. Let me have a look at that. I'm interested. I think that's the way to approach it. Because if you come in and say, well, I, I think all well, statins are bad. I don't want to take this. I think it's going to be a very short conversation, very unsatisfactory. So it's about trying to open up a dialogue. Um, and, and that would be my suggestion. But in some cases, it, it, will, it will be very difficult, I'm afraid. Um, but yeah, I hope that is helpful in some way. We have the same issue in the states where, you know, how do you approach your, your uh, GP and, uh, you know, throwing some figures out and you tell them that, you know, I heard that if I take a statin, it'll reduce my chance of having a heart attack by, you know, 1%. Um, what do you think about that? Or, uh, it, yeah, I think just kind of sharing information uh, and opening up and even including proper diet to... Uh, I mean, that's our goal is we want to talk to healthcare practitioners yeah. as well and to uh, just kind of uh, proliferate this uh, information about uh, the misunderstanding. Well, and keep in mind that doctors have a thing called standard of care that they have to follow. And if they go outside those parameters, then they could get into trouble. So they have to, for high cholesterol, write that script for the statin. That doesn't mean the patient has to fill it. They can educate themselves and get on their own. I'm certainly not advocating for that, but I'm just saying let the doctor do what the doctor has to do to keep them legal, but then you do what you've got to do to get healthy. I think it's worth pointing out that recently they changed some of the statin guidelines in the UK, and there's been actually been uh, quite a big pushback from GPs, yeah. I believe, in terms of they felt that that was really uh, too strict and, and that people are introducing statins too early. So I think, you know, the, the GPs are thinking about this and they are uh, you know, increasingly open-minded about this. So it's, that's just worth remembering that you know, they, they are starting to read about it and, and things are starting to change. So I think that's positive. And I said in my talk, they're, uh, the, the same thing, that uh, the, the, the GPs are really pushing back, even mainstream. Yeah, just they're saying, what's going on here? I, I think in most practices, you'll find, um, Look, you may come up against a roadblock with one particular doctor who may be a bit more closed-minded, for example. There is normally at least one GP I find in a practice which is open-minded or at least willing to have a conversation about this mm. kind of thing. Um, I don't think it's quite as closed-minded as we perhaps have thought. I think things are changing because what's happening is that people are realizing that a lot of the time what we're doing is actually not having the desired effect. And so... I really do feel a change is coming, and um, I feel the best way is not to be us at, us against them. It's to be inclusive and just open up a conversation. That's one. Uh, I have a general question about uh, the functional approach. Uh, like in your practices, what is um, what is the role of functional testing in, in like searching for the root cause of people's complaints, especially in like chronic cases? And do you use 
these kind of tests, and uh, if so, in what cases? And like, do you use any certain se sequence of testing? You know, layering them, how to figure out the root cause of the complaints? Um, for me, that has two answers. Within the National Health Service, which is the um, really the prime, it's the main. It probably does. I'm guessing 90, 95 percent of the healthcare in the United Kingdom. I don't think functional testing is allowable in the NHS. You cannot order those kind of tests. You can just do standard blood work. Um, I, my frustration with that has led me to sort of mixing up my time between NHS, but I also do private work where I see patients for an hour, hour and a half. I find it very, very satisfying. And I do use some form of functional medicine testing. Um, I, I do do stool tests sometimes. Um, do I do advanced blood testing? Yeah, from now and again I do. Um, but the more experience I'm getting at practicing like that, I find you can do a lot with a good clinical history. Mm -hmm. And taking time, you know, I spend an hour with patients to really try and delve into what's going on. You can really make a really good guess at what's going on and think, well, instead of paying that money for a test, maybe we can, you know, on sound clinical judgment, make a treatment plan. Let's review it in four weeks. If we're, if we're struggling at some point, we might want to go for the testing. So I personally try and keep expensive testing because that's a problem with some of it. Is. It is quite expensive and I don't feel you always need it. I think one of the criticisms that is leveled against some functional medicine practitioners, um, and I can understand it, is that there's too much testing going on. There's all mm -hmm. kinds of wacky testing going on that costs a lot of money. And I don't think it has to be that way. I think you can use the principles of it, talk to people, and this is what we get taught in medical school actually as well. It's actually take a good history. The history gives you most of the answers. I'm not against testing, but I only use it when I absolutely need to. I think this is um, an interesting point actually, and potentially a difference between the UK and the US in terms of medical training. And I know from my friends who went to um, med school in the US is the fact that in the UK we spend a lot of time learning how to take a history and a lot of time being exam you know with an examiner there checking us taking a history and there's something that's really drilled into us and I think that that's absolutely where you start if you can spend an hour which most doctors can't but if you can spend an hour talking to your patient that will get you most of the answers and I think that uh, from there most of the people that I work with are, are, are people where I where we can it's remotely and I work through a clinic in the US at the moment just because I'm doing a PhD in Norway so it doesn't really give me access to real patients at the moment face to face but um, a, a basic uh, blood biochemistry testing which is actually not very expensive at all is, is a place to start I think stool testing is important um, it's, but once you've decided that that's where some of the problems might might arise other things like uh, if you do it you could do a, a saliva test so you're looking at various different adrenal hormones but generally everybody who comes to the clinic at that point you know, you know you're going to see overall low cortisol with maybe high cortisol in the morning. Like, it's just, it's going to be the same in everybody. So actually, maybe you don't need to charge them how 300 pounds for the test because you know what you're going to see. Um, so I think the history, and then just some really basic, um, basic biochemistry and then maybe a stool test. Um, and there's lots of other things that you can do further down the line, but I think that's, that's where you'd start. So now I have to defend the U.S. since Tommy is poking at us. You but wanted some controversy. Yes, let's, let's, let's get into it. Uh, not physically, just mentally. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to win that physical battle. But, uh, yeah, so unfortunately it's true what he's saying. You know, our training is uh, how to uh, order expensive tests, and we put the uh, talking to the patient aside. Now, I question that. Uh, and uh, I actually talk to my patients, <laughs> and I listen. <laughs> so we're getting advice from the, from the NHS. But what R Rangan said, we do functional testing as well. In fact, Erin Kay, my physician assistant, I don't know if you have an equivalent here, but she's our functional gut uh, expert. And Jimmy, she's coming on the low-carb cruise, mm -hmm. and she has an amazing right. talk. I know, who, who gave a functional gut talk here? I wish Erin was here to... Yeah, Chris, Christine, Christine yeah, Bradley, yeah. Chris, yeah. So uh, Aaron is just a, an expert with functional gut, and so we do all that testing. But just on the counter, we have patients that come in that you know are, are self-educated. They're highly intelligent, and I just wrote down some of the tests that they've requested or that they brought into the office, such as um, heavy metal testing, adiponectin, leptin, MTHFR, other genetic testings. 
and they're all interesting. But the problem is we're, we're not sure that they're standardized. Genetic testing, although very interesting, is just associational. And so people come in and say, well, it's off. There must be something wrong. And so uh, it's difficult sometimes to interpret all these functional tests. And we just have to keep that in mind. Although you're looking at a bunch of doctors that understand that there's probably some value in it. I thought just very uh, quickly on the, on the heavy metal testing, um, most of the people that we see, if they, they send us a, a heavy metal test report, and what usually happens is that you, you take some kind of challenging device, so you take some kind of chelator, and then it pushes metals into your urine. Um, and, but what happens is then the standard reference ranges are based on normal people who haven't taken a chelator. So if you take a chelator and do a urine test, then you, it will look high because you're not comparing like with like. So it's very easy to do a test and, and for it to be reported as high. And yes, you, you might absolutely have some problem with heavy metals, but I think um, it's very it's very scary for patients that maybe that's not the real problem and, and the test is, is showing that. I just want to add there, I think, um, touching on what uh, Jimmy said before, I think there's two sides of the coin, this, uh, this whole social media revolution whereby people can now educate themselves and learn things for themselves and not rely on the institutions and the medical establishment to give them that knowledge, I think is great for patient empowerment. The, the flip side to that is I often have patients coming in uh, as Dr. Gerber yeah. just said, with a whole list of tests that they want doing, <laughs> or they have already got done, mm. or they're on a whole battery of 15 supplements that they've, and individually they can make a rational argument, and I possibly can on why they might individually have some value. I find my job often is to say, look, you, you, you know, we, we, we've got to take you off some of these things. You don't need all this testing. There is, a, there is a perception that the testing is going to give them the answers to all the problems they've had and no one's managed to figure out. And often, A, it's expensive, but B, often it's not the case. It comes back to, you've got to take everything in context. Whether you're a doctor, whether you're a, um, you know, a, a nutritional therapist, whether you're a life coach, I would say you, it's not just about the small things. You've got to take a step back and look at the big picture and see what actually, what's my leverage point here? What's actually going to start making a difference with that patient? And do I need to run expensive mm. tests for that? Um, and one thing I'm really proud of that the National Health Service stands for is that we only want to do testing if it's going to benefit the patient, if it's going to change your clinical protocol. If not, you tend not to do it. I think, I think it's a really good principle that we yeah. can all apply. Yeah. Thank you very much. We're out of time, you guys. Thanks so much, panel. Give them a hand. <laughs>